I'm going to be talking to you about um, vitamin D in uh, pregnancy and early life and um, taking, taking these topics a little bit further, mainly in the observational design. I'm also going to um, um, please reinhold and show you a very nice U-shaped curve, <laughs> so, um, which we tend to see in uh, some of our studies. But as you all know, it uh, um, has been quite overwhelming during the past few years to think about the amount of different health outcomes um, associated with the vitamin D. And uh, even, even for a researcher working in the field, it's, it feels a bit too much sometimes. However, I think that it's, um, there is a good reason why vitamin D might have such broad um, health um, consequences, because it's not simply a nutrient, but it's a pro-hormone. And importantly for such uh, wide-ranging um, influences on health is that the vitamin D receptors which are mediating the hormonal actions, they are found in most tissues and organs of the body. So they are not just in the bone, which is of course the classical target tissue, but they are everywhere. They are in um, most vital organs um, and various types of cell types. And importantly for uh, pregnancy and maintenance of health, um, healthy pregnancy, um, it, it really suggests that uh, vitamin D has something specific um, which is important for uh, pregnancy because vitamin D receptors, they are also found in the placenta, they are in the deciduous and they are in various types of immune cells which we know uh, that are important for, for maintenance of uh, pregnancy. Uh, this is a, an, just another list of um, the proposed um, health um, effects of vitamin D which comes from the uh, review by Michael Hollick, published a few years ago now, and which I have modified slightly. And um, in this talk, I'm going to be um, uh, focusing on hypotheses that are related to the effects of vitamin D on immune system. And I'm going to be using very simplified immunological paradigm, which we have uh, used in some of our epidemiological work to guide the hypotheses that we are um, um, interested in looking at. And if I start with, uh, with the um, uh, possible immunological link between vitamin D and uh, uh, with uh, vitamin D and pregnancy complications or even miscarriages, and this is something that I, I uh, came interested in a few years ago, and because uh, you can think about pregnancy uh, as an immunological challenge where the mother's immune system needs to adapt in a manner that it doesn't reject the paternal material which is um, in, inside the fetus. So there needs to be immunological adaptation. And um, uh, we believe that the immunological adaptation or part of that is uh, happening through a shift in the immune response pattern towards Th2 type um, domination in the cytokine respo um, uh, uh, response pattern. And what we have uh, uh, also seen is that the Th1 type of reaction, which is the opposite of that in, in this balance, um, uh, Th type reaction um, um, in the placenta, it's correlated with spontaneous preteen delivery and um, uh, miscarriages, and it could have possibly uh, a role in preeclampsia. And that was uh, something that um, um, I started thinking about a few years ago because uh, all this um, um, uh, fitted in very nicely with what we knew about the immunomodulatory properties of vitamin D. Because we know that the active hormonal vitamin D, it uh, attenuates Th1 mediated immune res responses. It also affects uh, dendritic cell maturation and regulatory T cell activity, all of which could be important for um, uh, prevent, preventing the immune maladaptation and loss of tolerance which happens in preeclampsia and possibly maybe miscarriages. Um, and I went through, um, um, given, given that there was very, fairly limited data available at the time, although today we have heard from uh, Professor Hollis's presentation that uh, now uh, there is some evidence also from randomized control trials, but um, at the time there was uh, limited data and uh, so I, I thought to conceptualize it through what we knew about how vitamin D is um, um, converted in the, in the metabolism and how that fitted in what we knew, knew about normal pregnancies and what we knew about uh, um, preeclampsia. 
So we know, and there are some animal experiments which are um, suggesting that vitamin D is required for normal reproduction. Whereas in preeclampsia there were some observational evidence uh, suggesting that there were the seasonal fluctuations which we see in uh, uh, vitamin D status, they were, uh, they were mirroring seasonal variations which we saw in preeclampsia. 1-alpha-hydroxylase, which is the key um, uh, vitamin D activator or, um, enzyme, it, it's known to be expressed both, both in the placenta and in deciduous. And we know from preeclampsia uh, pregnancies that the expression and activity is rest restricted. We have also today heard and seen data that the, well, the concentrations of the active hormonal metabolite of vitamin D, they are increased from early pregnancy. And there is a case control data showing that levels in preeclamptic cases are decreased compared to normal pregnant controls. Vitamin D receptors, at least they are expressed in uh, placenta and deciduous and macrophages. Um, we don't know that, uh, at least I don't know that much about how the expression might be altered in preeclamptic pregnancies or whether there might be genetic variations in preeclampsia related to VDR. And as mentioned, the effects that we believe vitamin D has on immune modulation, they are compatible with maintenance of normal pregnancy, whereas um, uh, the opposite um, associated with vitamin D deficiency um, uh, might lead to preeclampsia. So all of those steps fitted in very nicely with, um, with, with the hypothesis. And a few years um, from then, um, there was some um, evidence that came up um, the first one was from uh, Lisa Bodna's paper. So there was a twofold increase in preeclampsia risk for each uh, 50 nanomoles per litre decrease in 25 OHD. Um, there was another study a um, couple of years uh, later where they associated total dietary vitamin D intake with pre reduced preeclampsia risk. Also, supplement, vitamin D supplementation was associated with preeclampsia in this study, but not vitamin D intake from food. So th this was, um, um, of course, interesting. So, so the hypothesis, uh, starting from the Th1, Th2, vitamin D's influence on the, the mo modulation of the Th1 and Th2 type responses, it was uh, working in the um, uh, do, uh, during pregnancy, at least um, in the level that we were able to look at it in, the, in these um, observational data. But there is no reason why um, uh, vitamin D wouldn't have longer term influences also on the programming of um, immunological function and uh, long term influences on immunological uh, diseases. Because we know that the programming of immune system, in particular related to the tolerance re development, it starts before birth and um, during, uh, until delivery, it stays under close control of the maternal immune system. And we know that the uh, prenatal but also um, early postnatal period, they are an uh, important window of opportunity for immune programming. And this is uh, controlled by gene environmental interactions and various epigenetic mechanisms. And there is evidence for epigenetic regulation of uh, genes in the vitamin D pathway. We know that there is placenta-specific methylation of 24-hydroxylase, which is a, a key vitamin D clearance enzyme. There is also transcriptional regulation of the CYP27B1 gene, which is mediated by epigenetic modification. And CYP27B1 is the 1-alpha-hydroxylase, which is a key activator enzyme for vitamin D. And what I um, uh, have been working uh, a, so, a little bit with is uh, type 1 diabetes. And type 1 diabetes is an interesting immunological disease because it's a chronic autoimmune disease. It has multifactorial etiology where both uh, the genetic predisposition and some environmental risk factors are believed to be required. And it's a good candidate for long-term programming studies because it's known to have a long latency from the initiation of the disease to the uh, disease onset. Uh, and it is also now known that uh, insulin secreting beta cells are destroyed in a T cell dependent um, process. And importantly, well, our hypothesis is that the polarization towards Th1 upregulation is believed to be central in the pathogenesis of type 1 diabetes. So, at least in theory, it seems possible that vitamin D might be able to disrupt both the initiation and the progression of the T-cell mediated pathogenesis of type 1 diabetes. 
And because uh, maternal immune system has such a, uh, important influences on, on the offspring, it's um, interesting to think about what we know about um, vitamin D intakes during pregnancy and how that might affect the offspring subsequent risk of developing type 1 diabetes. But until now, there is still uh, very little data on this. There is um, um, uh, one Norwegian case control study, which was published now um, a bit over 10 years ago, where they found that maternal cod liver oil supplementation during pregnancy was associated with a markedly reduced risk of type 1 diabetes in the offspring. In their study, the results were inconclusive in terms of infants' cod liver oil intake or infants' own vitamin D supplementation. There is a small observational study from US, I think this is from the DAISY, um, DAISY trial, where they had a um, um, uh, bit over 200 children who were followed up until age um, four. And in this study, 16 of the children developed uh, diabetes-specific autoantibodies during the follow-up. And in the first report, they reported that maternal vitamin D intake via food was associated with the risk of um, 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 insulin autoantibodies. However, I believe that there is an update to this uh, study where they didn't find the same protective association once they were able to increase their numbers. So still uh, fairly inconclusive. There's also a Swedish study, which is uh, larger, and in that study um, uh, they again followed up uh, children for uh, seroconversion for, uh, to diabetes-specific autoantibodies. And they did find that use of uh, vitamin D supplements during pregnancy was associated with the reduced uh, diabetes-related autoimmunity at one year of age, but not anymore at 2.5. So not, nothing much really, if, if, but if one looks at with very positive classes, then maybe there is something going on. Um, what we did is that um, and, and based, based on the, on the uh, property that there, we believe that the immune system, it can be programmed, if you like, also during the early postnatal period. So we had the opportunity to use data from um, um, a large uh, Finnish uh, birth cohort study, which um, was initiated in 1966. And, um, <coughs> Uh, this study is quite interesting both in terms of the geographic location because it's uh, located plus minus 200 kilometers from the Arctic Circle, so it's very northern location. But it, um, what is making it even more interesting is that at the time of the study in the mid-1960s, the recommended dose of uh, infant vitamin D supplementation in Finland was 2,000 international units per day, so 50 micrograms per day. And we had information on, on the frequency of vitamin D supplementation that was given uh, to these children and also on the dosage. And in our study, we followed up uh, these uh, children born to these uh, studies for uh, occurrence of type 1 diabetes uh, using register linkage. And um, altogether we had 81 cases um, in this uh, cohort of a uh, bit over 10,000 individuals. And what was evident in, in this study was that the um, vitamin D uh, supplementation had a um, markedly strong dose response association with the um, frequency of uh, um, vitamin D supplementation. But also one other thing that this, this graph clearly shows, which was a key problem with our study, is that uh, the Finnish mothers, they were very prudent in following the public health recommendations at the time. So we had very small numbers of cases who didn't receive any vitamin D supplementation. Nevertheless, um, compared to, um, uh, when compar uh, comparing those um, children who had received vitamin D supplementation, either irregularly or regularly, there was a markedly strong reduction in their risk of developing type 1 diabetes later in life. And after adjustment for a wide range of factors, um, including things like whether the mother was following health education or whether the mother was depressed during pregnancy or whether the mother wanted the pregnancy, so very wide ranging um, um, uh, indicators which might also relate to how, how um, prudent the uh, mother was um, in taking care of her child, the uh, association, if anything, it just got stronger. We also looked at the association between the incidence of type 1 diabetes by the dosage of vitamin D supplementation, and these analyses we restricted only to the infants who all received vitamin D supplementation regularly. And again, we see a similar kind of significant and strong um, a reduction in their risk of developing type 1 diabetes 
with, uh, with the risk of de uh, decreased by further 80% um, in infants who had received vitamin D at the higher doses compared to those who received vitamin D at lower dosages. And again, we had data on whether they had been suspected of having had rickets during the first year of life. And those infants who were suspecting, uh, suspected of having had rickets were, had on average a threefold increase in their risk of developing type 1 diabetes compared to others. So uh, by all indicators which we had available, there was a um, marked and consistent association with the diabetes. So as I, as I was saying, that the, we, we did this study with the kind of like starting with a very simple TH, uh, um, notion on uh, vitamin D influencing the balance between TH1 and TH2 type cytokines. And uh, if this flip happens and if there is long-term programming uh, on, on the pa uh, mat, um, pattern uh, how how sub subsequent immune responses are made, then in addition to uh, type 1 diabetes, also preeclampsia could be decreased uh, longer term. So, so we, we took forward the hypothesis that those in, uh, infants or those girls who, when they were infants, had received vitamin D supplementation, they should have a lower risk of preeclampsia later in life when they were becoming mothers, if this hypothesis was true. But as I mentioned before, uh, one problem with our study was that we had very low numbers in, of individuals in the key exporosa groups, and that was um, um, affecting these analyses also because we had to further re restrict the um, study to those um, women who had become mothers, and uh, by omitting men, we obviously um, half the size of the cohort. But nevertheless, when we looked at the um, association um, difference between those women who had received regular vitamin D supplementation in infancy compared to those who didn't receive any vitamin D or who received it um, regularly, there was a 50% lower risk of um, um, them having preeclampsia later in life. The association between the dosage of vitamin D and which we again only looked at the uh, at the subgroup who all received vitamin D supplementation regularly, it wasn't significant. One could say that it was in the right direction, but um, really the confidence intervals are wide. But nevertheless, we observed some evidence for potential influences of uh, uh, infant vitamin D supplementation on subsequent risk of preeclampsia. But if we go back to this um, um, TH1, TH2 balance, and if we, if we believe in this hypothesis, and if we believe that type uh, uh, vitamin D attenuates the ACE1 responses, and the opposite of that is that it should aggravate the ACE2 responses. And there are some diseases, uh, uh, most notably allergy, which, which are uh, known to be associated with increased risk of, um, um, or increased the ACE2 uh, type pattern. So uh, we took this um, uh, data forward with the hypothesis that is there an association between large dose infant vitamin D supplementation with the subsequent risk of allergies in, in the 66 cohort? And we did find some evidence also for that. So here are the uh, outcomes that we had available from age 31. So um, atopy based on um, a skin prick test, allergic rhinitis, and um, asthma. And for all outcomes, after adjustment for a wide range of um, uh, potential confounders, we saw about a 30% increase in the risk for infants who had received vitamin D supplementation regularly compared to those who didn't receive at all. The association between dosage of vitamin D, it wasn't significant. Um, you could say that the, some evidence to support the uh, hypothesis was, was seen for allergic rhinitis or an asthma, but not really because the confidence intervals were wide. and. Uh, um, the association wasn't significant, as said. Um, so in addition to our own study, there are a few other studies which have suggested that high vitamin D intakes during pregnancy or high m uh, vitamin D, um, um, high maternal vitamin D stages during pregnancy might be associated with um, increased allergic outcomes later in life. And um, um, for example, there is a, a study by um, Gale and colleague where they observed the threefold risk of um, visible eczema um, in children at, at the age of nine months if their mothers had had higher uh, maternal, uh, con higher concentrations of 25 OSD uh, during pregnancy compared to others. 
Uh, they also observed the over fivefold increase in the risk of asthma at nine, nine years for mothers with um, for offspring with mothers with higher compared to lower vitamin D status. However, the asthma finding has often been criticised because for that time point they had a fairly substantial substantial dropout, which did in effect the eczema finding um, at uh, nine months to the same extent. There is also a recent paper from Australia where they um, associate. Um, uh, cod liver oil supplementation intake in uh, childhood with um, increased risk of high fe hay fever and asthma. So there is some, some evidence. Um, we also looked at this, again, if we're preeclampsia, uh, the association would be operating, um, or the vitamin D influences on immune balance would be operating uh, at the time and also potentially through long-term influences on, on risk. Then the same could be apply, uh, applied to the um, um, how we uh, how the allergic responsiveness is affected. So we, um, with this framework, we looked in the 1958 birth cohort, the association between 25 OSD concentrations and serum IgE concentrations. So higher IgE um, are often characteristic of higher allergic responsiveness. And what we did see is that, and here's the U-shaped re um, relation, is that when that for individuals who had the highest 25 OHD concentrations in our study, also their IgE concentrations uh, tended to be fairly markedly increased. But what about all this? I think that uh, probably uh, many of you might be more um, familiar with the hypothesis or, or the, all the kind of like studies suggesting that uh, um, vitamin D should be uh, beneficial in terms of preventing asthma and. Uh, um, uh, some people are uh, promoting fairly heavily that vitamin D deficiency might be to blame for the asthma epidemic. And here is this uh, review article is uh, one example of this where they, uh, where they um, uh, write that um, using data from two birth cohorts, which I'm going to show um, to you in a minute, um, the risk of asthma incidence caused by vitamin D deficiency in pregnancy is about 40% of all cases. So fairly for strong statements, and I'm not quite sure how they got up with that. But um, here are the two studies that um, I believe they, t uh, they based this statement on. And they were both published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition and in the same issue. And both of them were um, um, uh, studies on uh, about uh, 1,200 mother-child pairs. And both of them compared with mothers uh, in the highest um, um, quartile of uh, vitamin D intake compared to those in the lowest quartile. And importantly, in my opinion, in both studies, the main outcome was wheeze. It wasn't asthma. It was uh, wheeze during early life or wheeze during childhood. But for um, but uh, that said, in both studies, the association between higher maternal intakes with wheeze in these observational studies, it, it was very strong. So uh, the odds ratios in both uh, were about um, um, supportive of about the 60% 60, 60 lower, lower risk. And I think that one, one other thing which is interesting in these two studies is that the, when you look at the comparisons and uh, look at the quantities of vitamin D that, um, um, that they reported these women as, um, as taken, they were fairly modest and very modest compared to what we have heard today. Because, uh, for example, in here, in the highest, um, actually it's quintile, not a quartile, in the highest uh, quintile, mothers were receiving only less than 300 international units of uh, vitamin D per day, whereas their lowest was 77 international units. And also similarly low, a um, bit higher, but uh, fairly low intakes were also in this study, in this other study where the highest uh, quartile uh, was um, um, in less than 800 international units per day. So perhaps because the differences are, are or the intakes here are so, so small, perhaps it could suggest that it's the prevention of the severe deficiency that is beneficial here rather than anything, anything more. But of course, they are just observational data and uh, um, like everything else that I'm presenting uh, in, as part of this talk. If we take, uh, if we go back to this kind of like this U-shaped um, or, or this um, uh, IgE association curve that I showed before, um, the beneficial effects could be 
also supporting of, um, by, by this, this graph, because you can see that the IgE concentrations tend to be higher also in those individuals who have the lowest 25 OHD concentrations. And the IgE concentrations are, all, are going down with increasing intakes up to about um, uh, over 100 nanomoles per litre in this study. And I think that the, it's, um, like I mentioned, that the, um, um, there is this hypothesis that the vitamin D might influence the um, 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 TH1, TH2 type balance. And there is a very interesting animal experiment where, which might suggest and which might bring all this data together and actually give us some insights what might be going on under, uh, underneath this apparently controversial or contradictory evidence. Because in their um, study, they found that allergen-induced cytokine secretion in vitamin D treated animals was, um, uh, was affected so that the vitamin D um, treatment led to, as expected on the basis of influences on TH1, TH2 balance, decreases in the interferon gamma secretion, while there was increases um, uh, in IL-4 secretion. However, what they also reported was that uh, eosinophilia, which is a key pathophysiological feature of asthma, was also reduced. And they suggested that this could be, uh, through vitamin D, having beneficial influences um, through reduced inflammatory responses. And there is more and more evidence um, uh, arising that vitamin D might indeed be beneficial from uh, reducing infections and inflammation. And also these type of suggestions we see in our own data, and this is a, has recently come out in a British Journal of Nutrition, where we show there is the um, kind of like very strong uh, seasonal pattern that we see in 25 OHC concentrations in the 1958 cohort, and that is clearly associated with the kind of like pattern or in the prevalence of seasonal infections which we see in this same cohort. Also, when you look at stratifying by uh, season, there is uh, this inverse association between the prevalence of infections and increasing 25 OHD concentration um, across all seasons. And this, uh, this um, so I included this um, slide um, uh, simply as a kind of like a reality check on, on the uh, effects of that vitamin D has on immune function. And I've used a very, very simplified um, uh, paradigm in guiding some of the uh, epidemiological work that I have been doing, which is simply based on the balance and how vitamin D might affect the balance between TH1 and TH2 type responses. But that is, that is just part of the story. And there is uh, so many other actions that we believe that vitamin D has on the immune, immune function, and those can't be ignored. So it's, um, in my opinion, it's no surprise that there might be coming contradictory uh, findings, or apparently contradictory findings in some studies. It's because life is never as simple as one would hope it to be. So to summarize, um, um, it is very likely that vitamin D is a potential uh, uh, and powerful immunomodulator which can have long-term influences on immunological diseases such as type 1 diabetes or perhaps allergy risk. But there is a lot of evidence that they are accumulating for beneficial effects on um, inf infectious diseases and inflammation. Uh, and we also believe that the vitamin D deficiency, even if it would be um, not severe enough to be classified as a proper deficiency, so hypovitaminosis D, it may have important implications for the maintenance of normal pregnancy, but it also is likely to have long-term implications for offspring health.